Garden Science Lecture 2. In the last lecture, we learnt that there are five axioms or presuppositions that underpin the modern scientific method. These were the coherency axiom, which covers the laws of logic and set theory, and by which we prove the famous Cartesian statement, I think, therefore I am. The coexistence axiom, which is the presupposition that there is a reality that is external to our existence and about which our senses give us reliable information. The correspondence axiom, which determines if a coherent scientific theory is to be accepted based on how well it explains the given data set. The conservation axiom, which assumes the laws of the universe are conserved through space-time. We saw a beautiful demonstration of this axiom in the special and general theories of relativity and also learned that this axiom by its own definition must make science blind to non-repeatable events including the origin of life itself or the miracles that are performed in the Bible. And finally, Occam's razor, which is a useful rule of thumb that helps us to optimise scientific theories by eliminating explanations that are more complicated than the data set they are purporting to explain. The last principle, Occam's razor, makes the scientific method reductionistic and it is this reductionism that results in the scientific method having boundaries in terms of the questions it can answer. I argued that one important boundary was at the level of the human mind, as it is our mind which we use to generate scientific hypotheses in the first place. This meant that while entities below the hierarchy of the human mind are very amenable to scientific inquiry, entities above the level of the human mind, such as love, ethics and God, are not questions which are within the explanatory scope of science. In this lecture, we are therefore going to jettison all the red bits of our reality and just focus on the areas where science is a powerful tool. We are going to use the scientific tool of hierarchical reductionism and take a fascinating explanatory journey from biology through to fundamental physics. Let's start with some old fashioned 19th century biology. The theory of evolution. In the left and right panels, I have produced two trees of life. Those who are observant among you will notice that the left tree is not a real tree of life, but a Simpsons mock-up showing the evolution of Bart Simpson and the Simpson family. The right panel has the more scientific version showing how biological life can be divided into the taxonomy hierarchies of species, genus, family, order, class, phylum and kingdom. It is pretty obvious from the fields of taxonomy, the study of body plans of living creatures and paleontology, the study of the fossil record, that there are obvious physiological and morphological relationships between the different creatures, both living and extinct. This led Charles Darwin to propose the theory of evolution by natural selection. The theory of evolution, as first proposed by Darwin, went as follows. Living things over time can adapt themselves to changes in their environment. They do this in small step-like changes, where those changes which are favourable to the animal's survival are more likely to be passed on to the animal's offspring while those changes which are detrimental to the animal survival in the long term are eliminated from the creature's gene pool. This component of evolution is known as natural selection and evolutionists love to remind everyone that this is the non-random component of biological evolution. Over long periods of time, the small changes in a species when added together result in the birth of a new species as animals become reproductively isolated. Over very long periods of time, the accumulation of physiological changes means that creatures which once shared a common ancestor become further separated on the tree of life, leading to new genuses, families, etc. It is by this mechanism that the tree of life grows. At the time of Darwin, the source of biological variation was completely unknown, with a debate between naturalists as to whether animals during their lifetimes could adapt to their environment and then pass these adaptations to their offspring. This was called Lamarckian inheritance. 
or whether the variation that arose within the species was purely random and it was natural selection which amplified adaptations that were advantageous for survival while eliminating changes which were detrimental. With the birth of modern genetics in the 20th century, it became clear that the ability of creatures to adapt to their environment was wholly dependent on the degree of variation that could be randomly generated by changes in the genetic code. Thus, modern neo-Darwinism proposes that the growth of the tree of life is purely the result of random gene mutation coupled to non-random natural selection. This mechanism means that a lot of biological time is required in order to generate enough new useful information in a species genome. Therefore, in neo-Darwinism, natural selection becomes both the agent in eliminating harmful mutations and so maintaining existing biological functionality, while also, in rare cases, allowing useful mutations to be adopted into the genome of the species. For both Darwinism and Neo-Darwinism, the eye has always been the big test case for evolution. Most textbooks on evolution still use it as a prime example of how an eye can evolve by natural selection, as shown in the current slide. A common theme in all the evolutionary diagrams for the development of the eye is a mechanism for how a creature that possesses a light sensitive spot consisting of photoreceptors converts over a long period of time to a fully functioning eye with the invagination of the photosensitive spot into an eyeball and the slow evolution of the lens that focuses light as shown in the diagram. Yet these changes are largely morphological rather than true gains in biological function at a molecular level. At the time of Darwin, this was not a problem because naturalists at this stage did not appreciate that most of the complexity of life was at the micromolecular level. For them, a light sensitive spot required no explanation and we shall see why they thought like this in the next slide. Rather, they thought that the thing they needed to answer was how one got from a single, simple, light-sensitive spot to a fully functioning eye. The small step-like changes in morphology that occurred as the eye's anatomy took shape appeared to be a fully coherent, natural explanation for the development of such a complex organ. Thus, 19th century atheists felt very satisfied with classical Darwinian evolution because it appeared to give them the mechanism they needed to explain the design-like nature of the eye's complex physiology without invoking the action of an external creator. The reason naturalists in Darwin's time thought like this was because Darwin lived at the same time as another famous scientist, Louis Pasteur. Before Louis Pasteur did his famous broth experiments in the 1860s, it was believed that simple life could spontaneously generate. This theory was known as spontaneous generation or ab biogenesis. Louis Pasteur disproved ab biogenesis in the 1860s using sterilization techniques. The reason why it took so long for scientists to realize that simple life did not just spontaneously appear was due to the classic observation of food spoiling over time. For example, the fact that a fresh piece of meat left at room temperature over a period of a week or so produces maggots was taken as evidence that these organisms were so simple that they just spontaneously arose from the meat itself. If we were to summarize the 19th century view of the complexity of life at the time of Darwin, it would look like the diagram I have produced in the slide. At one end of the scale was the simple worm, which was seen as so elementary that it could arise spontaneously from non-living organic material. At the other extreme were human beings like David Beckham, who were seen as appropriately complex creatures that appeared to possess the hallmarks of design. I think David Beckham definitely is a complex creature. Therefore, the challenge for atheists in the 19th century was not to explain how a worm could arise, but how humans arose. And this is why Darwinian evolution was so popular in the 19th century. 
because humanists thought they'd found a way at last to explain human existence without invoking a maker. Interestingly, I believe that if aeroplanes had have existed at the time, humanists and scientists might have even concluded they were more complicated than humans because it was easy to spot the complex engineering that makes these aircraft work, whereas most of the technology of life was completely hidden from scientists in the 19th century because it was at the microscopic level. However, with the birth of microscopy and modern biochemistry, we know that the 19th century view of biological complexity is totally and utterly wrong. It turns out that an aeroplane is in fact simpler than a humble worm or arguably even more basic than a bacterium because the nanotechnology and cellular machinery that makes these life forms function is far more sophisticated as we shall see in a few moments when we begin to look at protein synthesis and DNA replication. Given that all the information required to make a human person is contained inside the nucleus of every one of our cells, it is not really all that surprising that life would possess the property of being able to change its morphology to the point of creating new species over long periods of time. The harsh truth of the matter is that in terms of biological information content, there is precious little difference between a small rodent and a human being, not something which was understood at the time of Darwin. Thus, the origin of the machinery of life itself was completely outside of the scope of Darwinian evolution, because it would be over a hundred years before this technology was ever suspected, let alone understood. Over the last 50 years or so, evolutionists who have wanted to use evolution as a way to justify their non-belief in God, have had to find a way to stretch the scope of the original theory of evolution to accommodate the origin of the nanotechnology of life itself. These new origin theories, known as molecular evolution, are as story-like and require as much faith as any religious creation myth. I shall now give you two very mainstream examples in this lecture and one other theory that Dawkins presents in his book, The Blind Watchmaker in lecture three and you can judge them for yourselves. The RNA world. The RNA world is a hypothetical stage in the evolutionary history of life on Earth in which self-replicating RNA molecules proliferated before the evolution of DNA and proteins. If the RNA world existed, it was probably followed by an age characterized by the evolution of ribonuclear proteins, the RNP world. Protein enzymes may have come to replace RNA-based ribozymes as biocatalysts because their greater abundance and diversity of monomers make them more versatile. As some cofactors contain both nucleotide and amino acid characteristics, it may be that amino acid peptides and finally proteins initially were cofactors for ribozymes. Again, let's not ask too many hard questions of this theory like how on earth we got from simple ribozymes to a full translation of RNA into proteins using a codon language. The hydrothermal vent theory. A new theory proposes the primordial life forms that gave rise to all life on earth left deep sea vents because of their invention of a tiny pump. These primitive cellular pumps would have powered life-giving chemical reactions. Let's not ask too much about that word invention in there. Authors of the theory argue the environmental conditions in porous hydrothermal vents when heated result in mineral laden seawater spewing from the cracks in the ocean crust. This creates a gradient in positively charged protons that serves as a battery to fuel the creation of organic molecules and protocells. Later, primitive cellular pumps gradually evolved the ability to use a different type of gradient, the difference in sodium and potassium ions inside and outside the cell as a battery to power the construction of complex molecules like proteins. And voila, the protocells could leave the deep sea hydrothermal vents and be the origin for all life on Earth. So do any of these theories really offer a compelling explanation for how life arose without the intervention of an outside intelligence? 
Well, let's now dive into the science of life itself, and I will leave you to make your own conclusions. We shall start at the physiological level of the immune system and then quickly move down the reductional hierarchy to proteins where we shall learn about RNA translation and DNA replication. We are all too aware that we live in a world which contains nasty pathogens. These pathogens include bacteria, viruses, our own cells when they become malignant, and finally other exotic life forms such as fungi, mycoplasm and parasites, worms, etc. So how do our bodies defend us against all these nasty pathogens? The answer is the immune system. The immune system is a very complicated physiological system that like a human army defends us from invading pathogens that would quickly kill us if our immune system stopped working. Like an army, the immune system has a unit which does the killing, the effector system and a system which controls when the effector system is activated and when it is switched off, the control system. The effector system consists of cell-based soldiers. We shall discuss these in the next slide. The effector system also contains protein-based weapons. Two of these weapons are antibodies and complement. Now, how best to explain complement? I think Terminator 2 can help. For those who are squeamish, you might want to look away at this next bit. Hey Gwen, you want some coffee? No thanks. How about a beer? Yeah, right. I got a full house. That's good, Lewis. Must be my lucky day. Complement is a little bit like Terminator 2. It consists of nine proteins which are found in the blood and which most of the time do nothing, and to all extent, like the Terminator, are completely hidden from view. However, when an antibody is bound to a bacterium, the first complement protein, C1, binds the antibody antigen complex, and this sets off a signaling cascade, which brings all nine proteins together to form an entity known poetically as the membrane attack complex. Just as the terminator appeared to take form from nothing as it rose from the floor, so the membrane attack complex forms from seemingly nothing. Like the fate of the poor prison guard, the ultimate form of the complement is a microscopic protein spike that pierces the bacterium's wall, causing its death via the loss of its intracellular contents. The control system contains the master cells known as T lymphocytes. There are T helper cells, which switch the immune system on. These are like the hawks and the T suppressor cells, which switch the immune system off, the doves. And finally, there are many, many protein messengers called cytokines, which are like the telegrams that coordinate all the different components of the immune army. In terms of the army of cells, let's look at them in turn. We start with the macrophages. Macrophages eat up bacteria and other invaders. T cells are the generals of the immune system. Monocytes are a type of white blood cell that can change into macrophages or dendritic cells, also known as antigen presenting cells, and we'll see why these are important in a moment. Neutrophils also eat up invaders. Neutrophils are the first responders of inflammatory cells to migrate towards the site of inflammation. They migrate through the blood vessels, then through interstitial fluid, following chemical signals into leukins in a process called chemotaxis. 
They are the predominant cells of pus, accounting for its whitish yellow appearance. Although they are the first responders, they need help from other immune cells to resolve infection. B cells, which look very much like T cells, and this is why I've not put an extra picture on the slide, produce soluble antibodies which bind foreign pathogens interfering with their function and marking them out for cell-mediated destruction by phagocytes and macrophages. So let's see the immune system in action. The video you're about to see is a combination of real face contrast microscopy showing real macrophages in the act of phagocytosing, eating up bacteria. The video also contains quite a bit of fancy computer graphics to give you a more 3D feel for what is going on between your cellular soldiers and the enemy. One of the design challenges of the immune system is that it needs to be able to rapidly activate when an invading pathogen has been detected and quickly produce the right antibodies that combine the protein shapes that are present on the enemy invader and so disable it or mark it out for phagocytosis. However, the cells in our own bodies also produce a repertoire of molecular shapes and it is imperative that our immune system does not attack those. Immune self-tolerance is an extremely complicated subject, which is still only partly understood, but it involves both positive and negative selection of B and T cells. Just as it is not possible for a single soldier to launch an intercontinental nuclear missile because the engineers were sensible enough to create two independent switches that required two trained personnel to operate, in the same way, all T helper cells can only activate if their antibody receptor and their CD28 receptor are bound. Therefore, the T cell cannot activate if it happens to only bind its target antigen. It can only activate if it occurs via an antigen presenting cell, which also binds the T cell CD28 receptor as shown in the diagram on the slide. This is why full blown autoimmune disease is thankfully a fairly rare condition. To give you an idea of how dangerous it is to mess about with the CD28 receptor, in 2006, a humanized antibody that binds the CDA28 receptor was given to subjects as part of a first phase clinical trial. Six of the volunteers had to be hospitalized with multiple organ failures, again demonstrating that we still have a lot to learn about immunological control in humans. We are now going to return to one of the weapons of the immune system, the antibody. Antibodies are very complex Y-shaped multi-domain proteins with a constant region and two hypervariable regions which form the upper arms of the Y shape. It is these arms that give the antibody its unique antigen binding properties. The proteins that make up the antibody are themselves made up of long strings of amino acids as shown in the next slide. There is an alphabet of 20 basic amino acids which are used to build proteins. The chemical structures of these amino acids are shown in the left panel. 
These amino acids can be further modified once the protein is built, giving biology a very rich variety of building blocks to build its complex molecular machines. The amino acid sequence information required to make a protein is contained in the nucleus of the cell. All proteins are encoded inside the nucleus of every cell by a long thread-like molecule called deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA for short. But nuclear DNA is like a tightly closed book, containing the master information to make all the proteins your cell needs. This master copy must be preserved, so the little ribosomal robots that make protein are not allowed to get their hands on the master copy. Instead, the cell transcribes or photocopies little sections of the master book into another molecule called ribonucleic acid. These little sections of DNA are the genes, and there is one gene per protein in general. The ribosomes read the code on the RNA and translate it into protein. So this slide is a diagrammatic representation of protein translation. The green blob in the centre is called a ribosome, and it is a multi-protein ribozyme complex. It is the RNA part of this complex that acts as an enzyme, and it is on which the whole pre-RNA hypothesis for the origin of life is built. Protein translation is an incredibly complex process involving three types of RNA. The messenger RNA is the template that controls the final amino acid sequence. The ribosome slides along the RNA template and special tRNA molecules, which are attached to an individual amino acid, enter the complex surrendering their amino acid, which is joined onto the growing polypeptide. You can see coding mRNA sequence here and the growing polypeptide here. Now here is a puzzle for you all. The RNA template only consists of four bases, yet we need to encode 20 amino acids. So how do we do that? If we were to read the four nucleotides two at a time, we would have 16 possible permutations, which is not enough. Therefore, we need three nucleotides, which gives us a total of 64 possible permutations to code the full complement of 20 amino acids. In the slide above, I have produced the translation table that is just about universal across all living things from the most basic bacterium to ourselves. Obviously, with 64 permutations coding only 20 amino acids, there is a lot of redundancy in the table. In general, amino acids, which appear more frequently in a protein, tend to only need the first two letters of the three, the three nucleotides are referred to as a codon, to specify the amino acid. So, for example, a codon starting with the letter GU will always code valine, no matter what the third nucleotide is. This redundancy makes the genetic code a little less sensitive to single nucleotide mutations. A genetic mutation that does not lead to a change in the amino acid sequence is called a silent mutation. Note also the three codons UAA, UAG and UGA in purple on the table. These are the stop codons and they tell the ribosome when protein translation is complete. When the ribosome reads one of these codons, it releases itself from the polypeptide it has been making. Finally, AUG, which encodes the amino acid methionine, also is the universal start codon. So all proteins have the first amino acid as methionine. So we have now seen how cells get from the master DNA copy to protein by first transcribing the DNA into RNA and then translating the RNA into protein. Yet every time a cell divides, it needs to create a complete copy of its nuclear DNA so that the two new daughter cells also contain a brand new tightly closed book containing the master information to make all the proteins the cell needs. DNA replication and cell division are two of the most complex and wonderful processes that exist in all cell biology. The following video animation will now show you some of the complex nanorobotics that is required to make these processes work and which is going on inside your body right at this very moment.
DNA is a good place to start, the double helix molecule we always talk about. This is a scientifically accurate depiction of DNA created by Drew Barry at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute of Medical Research. If you unwind the two strands, you can see that each has a sugar phosphate backbone connected to the sequence of nucleic acid base pairs, known by the letters A, T, G, and C. Now the strands run in opposite directions, which is important when you go to copy DNA. Copying DNA is one of the first steps in cell division. Here, the two strands of DNA are being unwound and separated by the tiny blue molecular machine called helicase. Helicase literally spins as fast as a jet engine. The strand of DNA on the right has its complementary strand assembled continuously, but the other strand is more complicated because it runs in the opposite direction. So it must be looped out with its complementary strand assembled in reverse, section by section. At the end of this process, you have two identical DNA molecules, each one a few centimeters long, but just a couple nanometers wide. So to prevent the DNA from becoming a tangled mess, it is wrapped around proteins called histones, forming a nucleosome. These nucleosomes are bundled together into a fiber known as chromatin, which is further looped and coiled to form a chromosome, one of the largest molecular structures in your body. You can actually see chromosomes under a microscope in dividing cells. Only then do they take on their characteristic shape. Otherwise, the DNA is more strewn inside the nucleus. The process of dividing a cell takes around an hour in mammals. So this footage is from a time lapse. You can see how the chromosomes line up on the equator of the cell. Now when everything is right, they are pulled apart into the two new daughter cells, each one containing an identical copy of DNA. Now as simple as this looks, the process is incredibly complicated and requires even more fascinating molecular machines to accomplish it. So let's look at a single chromosome. One chromosome consists of two sausage-shaped chromatids containing the identical copies of DNA made earlier. Each chromatid is attached to microtubule fibers, which guide and help align them in the correct position. The microtubules are connected to the chromatid at the kinetochore, here colored red. The kinetochore consists of hundreds of different proteins working together to achieve multiple objectives. In fact, it's one of the most sophisticated molecular mechanisms inside your body. The kinetochore is central to the successful separation of the chromatids. It creates a dynamic connection between the chromosome and the microtubules. For a reason no one's yet been able to figure out, the microtubules are constantly being built at one end and deconstructed at the other. While the chromosome is still getting ready, the kinetochore sends out a chemical stop signal to the rest of the cell, shown here by the red molecules, basically saying this chromosome is not yet ready to divide. The kinetochore also mechanically senses tension. When the tension is just right and the position and attachment are correct, all the proteins get ready, shown here by turning green. At this point, the stop signal broadcasting system is not switched off. Instead, it is literally carried away from the kinetochore down the microtubules by a dynene motor. That's the walking guy. This is really what it looks like. It has long legs so it can avoid obstacles and step over the kinesins, molecular motors that walk in the opposite direction. I hope that video helps you appreciate the incredible nanotechnology that God has built which allows us to live, love, work, play and hopefully worship and give him thanks. Returning to our original hierarchical reduction tour, we have now moved from evolution, which is relating species to each other, down through immunology, which is relating cellular systems together, down through molecular biology, examining both DNA replication, RNA transcription and protein translation. We are now ready to go one level below molecules and look at the laws of the universe that allow these complex systems to exist in the first place. 
we are about to enter the world of physics. The story of physics is a classic story of scientific reductionism, where complex processes have been unified into more encompassing single theories. For example, electricity and magnetism, which were once thought to be separate forces, were unified into electromagnetic field theory, with light being shown to be a propagation of electromagnetic radiation. As unification continued, new universal constants were derived, which were the central values controlling the properties of the universe. It soon became apparent that these constants had to be very close to the values they were found to be in order for life and for us to exist. The finding has become known as the fine tuning of the universe. The famous physicist Roger Penrose, a British contemporary of Stephen Hawkins, concludes that the starting conditions that lead to our current universe were one chance in 10 to the 10 to the 123. This number is not conceivable. It is estimated that there are 10 to the 80 atoms in the entire universe. This is a one with 80 zeros after it. In order to get from 80 to 123 zeros after it, we must multiply the entire number of atoms of the universe by a billion, 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 10 million. We then must take the number one and write this number of noughts after it, which of course is impossible, as there are a billion, 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 10 million more noughts in this number than the estimated atoms in the entire universe. Therefore, a very natural interpretation is that the universe is a product of an intelligent conscious being that has purposed it for the creation of other conscious beings. Let's now see how the atheist physicist and Manchester University celebrity Brian Cox presents the fine tuning of the universe. In the case of a Japanese sword, if you get all the ingredients right, a precise mixture of iron and carbon, you get the temperature right, you get the hammering right, everything right, over a year, then you get the perfect sword. Now, in the case of the universe, the ingredients aren't things like iron and carbon, of course. The ingredients are a set of numbers. They're called constants of nature. They're things like the strength of gravity, the speed of light, and the masses of the particles. And they also require precision. They have to be set in just the right way if you want a universe that supports life. In the same way that a samurai sword would be weakened if the ingredients were different, the universe might be unable to support life if the constants of nature were somehow altered. Now, if I were some all-powerful deity, which arguably I'm not, then I could imagine varying all those constants of nature to see what happened. I could imagine some great big control board with little knobs on it. One of them changes the strength of gravity. The next one changes the mass of the electron. The next one changes the speed of light. And the question is, how much freedom do I have if I want living things to exist? The answer is, not very much freedom at all. If, at the Big Bang, the strength of gravity were increased, then the universe would have collapsed in on itself before life had time to evolve. But if the strength of gravity were decreased, then galaxies wouldn't form, so there'd be no planets, no stars, and no life. If you decrease the speed of light by just a few percent, our universe would have no carbon in it. Increase it by about the same amount, and our universe would have no oxygen. Because we have no idea why the constants are the values that they are, then we're presented with something of a mystery. Because you can ask the question, well, if it's just random, if indeed the universe began and somehow these random numbers got chosen, then how lucky are we that we exist? How lucky are we that we live in a universe where those constants are just right to allow galaxies to form and stars to shine and elements like carbon to form in the hearts of stars? Wow, Brian, we're so incredibly lucky. It's time now to look at Newton's cradle. 
The unification of the laws which underpin the workings of our universe were also shown to be time symmetrical because fundamental quantities such as momentum and energy are conserved. The little video above shows a Newton's cradle in action. In real life, with the progress of time, one would notice the progression of time as the ball's motion getting less and less until the cradle returns to a static position. However, if the collision between the balls was perfectly elastic, then the cradle would keep rocking back and forth forever like this looped video. In this situation, if you ran the video backwards, you would not be able to distinguish it from running it forwards. It is what physicists call time symmetrical. So if all the laws of the universe are time symmetrical, why are so many naturally occurring changes in the world time asymmetrical? Well, let's take a look. It is now time for an exercise. What I would like you to do is look at the two pictures and place them in chronological order. I think the first one is pretty easy and it goes like this. What about the second one? Again, I think it is pretty easy in that we can put the smashed up car in the present and the lovely nice car in the past. What about this one? Well, this is trickier because you could put it either way around. You can start with a messy room and end up with a tidy room, or you can start with a tidy room and end up with a messy room. But if we put it from messy to tidy, then in fact, we need another agent involved, and that is either mum or dad who has cleaned up the room of their messy child. So why does this happen? Well, it is actually all to do with probability. And probability is so fundamental that it actually controls what is known as time's arrow or the direction of time. So at this point in the lecture, I got those watching to break into four groups and I gave them three coins each and they had to toss them as many times as they could in five minutes, recording each time how many heads and tails were showing on the three coins and scoring it in the table above. I also made this into a race and surprisingly, the young people's table at the talk did not win the race, only scoring 16 throws while the winning table scored 30. If you're watching this video at home, you might like to try this exercise. I then collected from each group their data and we plotted it into a frequency histogram as shown in the next slide. Now, unfortunately, I don't have the original data from the group's coin tossing exercise. So I've had to generate my own coin tossing data, which I've done this morning, literally by sitting down with three coins and tossing them over and over again. But this is the real data that I generated this morning, and you are now going to see it plotted on some graphs in the next slide. So here you will see I have Excel open with a little workbook I developed for this lecture series. As I mentioned previously, I spent the morning coin tossing and created four groups of data where three coins were tossed 30 times to give the following values. Group one, I got one triple head, 10 two heads and one tail, 12 one head and two tails, and seven triple tails. Group two, six triple heads, nine two heads and one tail, 13 one head and two tails, and two triple tails. Group three, six triple heads, 10 two heads and one tail, 11 one head and two tails, and three triple tails. And last but not least, group four, three triple heads, 12 two heads and one tail, 11 one heads and two tails, and four triple tails. 
Can you see the pattern? Looking at the data, it is clear that two heads and two tails scores consistently higher in all the groups than having all tails or all heads, despite, of course, some variation between the groups. The reason this is so is because there is three times more ways of getting two heads or two tails than there are of getting all heads or all tails. Well, coin tossing takes some time. So let's switch to a dice program and get the computer to generate some numbers for us. This program I can generate between one and four dice and I can throw the dice, you can see a maximum of 10,020 times. Throwing the dice this number of times gets rid of statistical variation and we really will see how the data normalizes over a large number of throws. So let's start with just one dice and I'm gonna throw it now 10,020 times. So here I go. There it goes, working away. Takes a bit of time, there it goes. So you can see that overall it's pretty flat as it would be expected, that one to six will come out pretty evenly since there should be no bias between those numbers. Let's now change it to two dice and do it again. So here we go, now we have two dice and it's working away. Now you can start to see this pattern happening again. So obviously you can't have one because with two dice the lowest is two, but you can see that the number seven dominates over the number two and 12 because it's much, there's many more ways of getting a seven than there is of getting a two or a 12. Well, not many more ways, but there are more ways. Let's have a look at what happens when we put three dice in. So now we're going for three dice. You can see the computer working away, generating its numbers. And now you can see that the num to get a three, a triple one, or an 18, a triple six, is much harder than to get the central numbers 10 and 11 what about four dice? This is the last one we can do. So here we go, we're working on all four dice and here it goes, it's calculating all the numbers. There we are. So now you can see that with four dice, it's very, very difficult to get four. We only had five out of the 10,000 throws. And again, at 24, we can see if we move down here, we only had six. But the central numbers of 13, 14, 15, we get many, many more dice throws, many, many more combinations. 13, we had 1,107, 14, 1,094, and 15, 1,085. And the reason why is because to get these numbers, there are many more ways of generating the numbers 13, 14, and 15 than there are of generating the lower or higher numbers. And so we get this very, very clear pattern forming with the mean, interestingly enough, being 14.05. In fact, I'll just do it again and let's just see how much that mean varies. Ready? Here we go again. We'll just do it a second time. Just generating. And you can see it's, it's again 14.09. So it really is coming out at the value of 14. I can do it a third time. And again, it will be a mean around 14, 13.93. So there's a little bit of variation, but you can see the mean is overall coming out at 14 because the number 14, 13, and 16 dominates over the, over the lower and higher numbers. Although each was a frequency distribution, the frequency that each dice combination appears becomes the probability of it appearing when the number of throws is large and the count for a particular combination is divided by the total number of throws. If one focuses on the outliers, which I've colored blue, one can see that as the number of dice increase, the frequency distribution normalizes towards the most likely sum of the dice with special states like all ones or all sixes becoming completely swamped by the more probable events. One can see this mathematical phenomenon in this slide. The chances of throwing a double one, snake eyes, is one in 36. 
Yet with three dice, the probability of throwing a triple one drops to one in 216. With four dice, it is now less than one in a thousand. With 10 dice, the chances of getting all 10 dice to show one is now less than one chance in 60 million. Here is an interesting thought experiment for you all to consider. If someone was to say that they were going to throw 10 dice and if they come up all ones, they are going to kill you, but any other permutation, they will give you 10 million pounds, would you risk it? Well, on the basis of probability, you would because the chances of dying are much less than when you set off each morning in your car for work. Therefore, you have a nearly perfect chance of earning 10 million pounds with much less risk than being involved in a fatal car accident. By the time we get to 102 dice, all showing one, 52 snake eyes, the probability is an incredible one chance in 1.87 times 10 to the 80. The reason I have chosen 102 dice is because the denominator of this probability is the same order of magnitude as the estimated number of atoms in the entire universe. And yet this stupidly small probability pales into insignificance when one considers the probabilities involved in real molecular systems. For example, in just 18 mils of water, there are 6.023 times 10 to the 23 molecules of water. What would be the probability of finding all these water molecules aligned exactly the same way? Well, it is so small that it will never happen, just like it will never come to pass that half the people in this hall will suddenly asphyxiate because all the random motion of the oxygen molecules has just happened to move all the oxygen to the right side of the room, leaving the left side of the room devoid of this life-giving molecule. What we are studying here is known as the second law of thermodynamics and it is based purely on the laws of probability. The fact that random states fire out numbers ordered states means that in a thermally isolated system that is undergoing a spontaneous process, the randomness or disorder of the system must always increase. When I say far out numbers, I do not mean by many billions, I mean by numbers which we cannot even write down, let alone comprehend. So the second law of thermodynamics can be stated as follows. The disorder entropy of a thermally isolated system undergoing a spontaneous process must always increase. Note the words thermally isolated. It does not mean that one cannot introduce order in one system by decreasing order somewhere else. This is exactly what we do as living things. We don't strictly eat to get new energy, as energy is neither created nor destroyed. No, we take in nutrients which are ordered and then use their order to maintain the order of our own bodies while we excrete into our environment more disordered waste products. When we create something, for example, manufacture a car, we are increasing the order in the open system that constitutes the car while decreasing the order in the overall universe. So where does that leave us? Well, we have seen in this lecture some of the most amazing nanotechnology in the form of molecular robots that power life itself. We have also discovered from fundamental physics that the cosmological constants of the universe are finely tuned to allow these complex robots to exist in the first place. Finally, we have discovered via the laws of probability that ordered molecular states that are seen within living things are not something that naturally occurs because these states are far outnumbered by the many disordered states that the same molecules can be arranged to make non-living things. Therefore, a powerful counter-question, we can ask all those who are convinced that atheism is so proven that it does not require faith, is this. Given modern scientific data and the fact that God is not scientifically observable, what other data set could we get from the cosmos which would be more consistent with the theory that it is a product of an external agency? And I believe the answer to that question is there isn't another data set. So where does that leave us in our tug of war? Well, the level of nanotechnology I've presented in this lecture 
coupled to the fine tuning of the universe and the fact that with time things move towards more probable disordered states appears to put modern science very much on God's side. Hang on, not so fast, pale face. Atheist thinkers are also aware of these amazing data and obviously they have come up with their own arguments to try and counter the obvious conclusion that the universe, given it is not eternal, has been created by an omniscient and omnipotent being. The common atheist counter arguments will be the subject of the first part of my final lecture. I also answered a question which was one of my own that I put on the video that was explaining the way DNA was copied and how one of the strands must be copied in little sections and then those strands joined up to make a single DNA strand. The reason this is the case is because DNA polymerase can only synthesize DNA in one direction, whereas the DNA strands of the DNA duplex run in opposite directions. But why could God not have made two DNA polymerases, one synthesizing in the normal five to three prime direction and another one synthesizing in the three prime to five prime direction? The five and three primes are just chemical nomenclature which people have come up with to orientate molecules such as DNA. So why can one not have a proofreading three prime to five prime DNA polymerase? Well, consider the above graphic. This is the normal direction of synthesis of DNA polymerase. In the diagram, we're about to add a guanine to another guanine base at the three prime end of the DNA polymer as shown by the blue arrow. The enzyme will use the energy generated from cleaving off the triphosphate group to join the guanine to its neighbour. Now let's imagine that the enzyme had made an error and rather than putting in guanine it should have put in an adenine. The enzyme has a cleaving domain that simply cuts off the wrong nucleotide. Once this has happened, the whole process is repeated, but this time the correct nucleotide is added using the triphosphate group. The nucleotide is now attached to the adenine, and it is this phosphate group that is circled that is used as the energy source to make this join happen. Now let's imagine an enzyme that could build the DNA chain in the opposite direction from 3' prime to 5'. Prime. This could work, but this time the phosphate group that supplies the energy of the reaction is located on the nucleotide that is already attached to the DNA polymer, shown inside the blue circle. Now let's imagine that this time the enzyme has added an adenine, but it was meant to add a thymine, so it would then cleave off the wrong base as shown. Now it can't add the thymine to the growing nucleotide because the triphosphate group that powers the reaction is on the wrong side of the nuclear side. Thus the reaction would permanently stall. And this is why it is not possible to create a proofreading DNA polymerase that works in the three prime to five prime direction. This is a classic demonstration of what engineers call design specification where certain obvious solutions become impractical due to other more important functions that are required from the operational process. And it is something which is important because often many atheists love to rubbish the design of biology and say, oh, that, I wouldn't have done it that way or I wouldn't have done it this way. But they speak from more of ignorance rather than from knowledge because I think often we simply don't understand the finer details of why God has made the biological system the way he has. In this situation, we do understand it, but there are plenty of other examples where the subtleties of design have probably eluded us. So it is a bit dangerous to conclude so quickly that the design is bad, just because it doesn't quite make sense to us. I shall leave it there, but I hope you have enjoyed this second lecture.